Hello, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Global Market Outlook webinar presented by Ide Bailey. And with that, I'd like to hand the time over to Brad Kelly for introductions. All right. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Nanette, and welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brad Kelly. I'm the principal in charge of Ide Bailey Financial Services. And uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'm excited about the next hour or so that we're going to be spending together. Um, really excited about the information we'll be sharing with you, excited about the speaker that we have today, and uh, then also excited that we just we can have interaction today. And as Nanette said, take advantage of the Q&A function uh, on the Zoom platform, submit your questions throughout our time together, and uh, we will get to those. We're going to spend the first half or so of our time together uh, hearing from our guest speaker, his thoughts and insights into what's happening in the global markets, and uh, then we'll spend the, the second half of our time together really addressing the questions that you're submitting. We already have a number of questions that have been submitted. Uh, when a number of you registered for this webinar today, you did submit questions. So we already have some, some of those teed up and, and ready to go. You know, last August, we held uh, a webinar much like this, where we had our very own Darren Pladson, uh, Director of Investment Strategy here at Ide Bailey, along with Dana Dioria from uh, Symmetry Partners in, in Glastonbury, Connecticut. And we had kind of a panel discussion that, that we did uh, at that time, went over very well. We re received a lot of uh, positive feedback on both the content and the format. And we knew we wanted to do something like that again. Um, so as we were putting this together for today, we reached out to one of our key strategic partners, Charles Schwab, to uh, inquire if there was somebody from their research team that would join us today and talk to our partners and our clients and share uh, insights. And um, I have to be honest, I, I was uh, kind of uh, uh, over the top when I heard we were getting Jeffrey Kleintop today to spend time with us. Uh, Jeff, Jeffrey's the chief global investment strategist at Charles Schwab. And um, you know, when I heard that I was, like, wow, this is pretty cool that we're getting somebody uh, at this level uh, uh, talking to us today. So Jeff and his team spend time analyzing the global markets, the trends that are going on, uh, the events that are happening around the world, and the impact that that might have to both the equity and fixed income markets from a global perspective. Um, you may be, if you watch a lot of CNBC, Bloomberg TV, you probably have seen him. Uh, on those networks, and he's on there frequently, um, just adding his thoughts and insights to um, to their broadcast. And so, you know, before I turn it over to you, Jeff, I'm going to be kind of honest with everyone. We had a call scheduled for Friday um, to meet each other for the first time and uh, get to know each other and then talk about the logistics of today's call. And uh, in anticipating that uh, call, I was getting pretty nervous meeting. In fact, I told my wife, uh, she saw me Friday afternoon with a, with a coat on. And she said, well, what are you wearing a coat for on a Friday afternoon? And I said, well, meeting Jeffrey Kleintop, like this is a pretty big deal. <laughs> and uh, so we, we met and uh, I appreciate you being patient with me uh, on Friday as I was probably a little nervous, but enjoyed the conversation, uh, found you to be very engaging, easy to talk to. And I know our folks today are going to feel the same uh, thing as they hear from you. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to you, Jeff, and let you take it from here. Thanks so much for that warm welcome, Brad. And, and thanks to all of you for, for joining. I, I hope I'm gonna be uh, uh, yeah, just as engaging with all of you. As we talk about things that are going on around the world, I like to say it's a bull market of things to talk about. Uh, there's so much going on. Likely I'm gonna touch on many things that are important to you. But there may be some things you'd like to dive more deeply into or things I, I didn't touch on at all that are important to you. That's what the questions are for. So as Brad said, make sure you get those questions in there. Uh, we'll get to those in the second half of this, uh, this uh, um, uh, event here. And we'll make sure we, we, we've got plenty of time to get through those because that, that is uh, really important. I'm going to talk to you in this first, let's say, half hour or so about the trends that I think are most important right now. Uh, I'm gonna start off with uh, the virus, uh, the vaccine prospects. I'm gonna talk a lot about uh, we're, we're a little bit of where we came from and where we are right now and why that 
that experience is really important, meaning looking back to the, the, the recovery where we were at the beginning of this year versus where we are now, but then looking forward to the remainder of the fourth quarter next year, what's in store, what are the guideposts we're going to be watching for, uh, and then uh, looking at, of course, the prospects uh, coming out of the election. What does all that mean? Uh, what does what the Brexit trade agreement situation look like right now? What does that mean for Europe and the UK? And of course, what's going on with, gosh, this week is uh, tomorrow, is Singles Day in China, the world's largest shopping online shopping day. Uh, doubles the sales of Black Friday and Cyber Monday in the US combined. It is an enormous day centered in China, but felt around the world. That's going on. Uh, so lots of things happening. I'm going to take you through all of that. And then I'm going to conclude with, I think, some important investment takeaways, some tied to the election, but more tied to a rotation in the market that happens every time we start a new global economic cycle. People miss this routinely. Even if they see the recession coming, they often miss the rotation in the types of leadership we see in the market that, uh, that accompanies it. So I want to emphasize that because I think that's really important. But let me start by looking back just a little bit. I want to take you back to what I think is, is uh, maybe the most important single economic statistic I look at every month. It's one that captures everything. It's this blue line here. It's the composite leading index for the world economy. It's put together by the OECD. That's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's a global think tank. They've been around a long time. What they're doing here is they're trying to give you a sense of what the entire economy is doing in just one reading. It's updated every month. And this line, they'll tell you when it's over 100 and rising, the global economy is accelerating, picking up speeds, good times. And when it's below 100, things are slowing down and deteriorating. But I don't care about any of that. I care about 99. That's the line I care about. I drew that little threshold across there because that's where in the past, whenever we crossed down through 99, we were either in one of those gray columns or about to enter one. Those gray columns are recessions, right? When we're losing jobs, earnings are falling, the economy shrinking, and stocks are falling anywhere from 20 to 50%. They're bad times for sure. Now, uh, what we were seeing last year, late last year, and into early this year, was that line was falling. It was below 100 and marching down towards that 99 threshold. A year ago, we put out our outlook for 2020 in, in late November, early December of last year. And this is my lead chart. This worried me. The entire globe was slowing down. This is pre-COVID. We saw six of the G7, six of the group of seven countries. You know, whenever you see those pictures of all the world leaders sitting around a table, well, that's the G7 meeting. Six of those seven countries were in recession in the fourth quarter of last year. They had zero GDP or negative GDP. I'm talking about the UK, Canada, Japan, Italy, France, Germany. The US was the only one excluded from that, but the US was slowing pretty fast. Growth was below average and heading down. In fact, profits for S&P 500 companies were already turning negative uh, in, the, in the third and fourth quarter of last year. So um, I, I, on a year over year basis, their growth rate was turning negative. We weren't losing money. Businesses were just making less than they were a year earlier. So the, the problem was we were already slowing down. And my point going into this year was just, we needed a small push, just a little push to get us into another one of those gray columns well, we didn't get a small push at all. We got a huge push from something nobody thought uh, nobody thought of, which was, of course, COVID-19. And you can see what it did to that blue line. Dropped it well below what we saw in the 2008 financial crisis to the lowest levels we've seen in over 50 years. But look what's happened since then. You can barely see it, but it's rebounded all the way back to 99 all the way back. That's a V-shaped recovery, right? You may have heard about this. This is a, a letter economists love to talk about, the V-shape. We got it, but it's not good enough. And that's why I'm showing you this, because the V-shape isn't good enough. It just gets us back to where we were late last year, which wasn't good, as I just pointed out. Most of the economy was in recession. Earnings were falling. These were not good times. We need a V-plus shaped recovery to really get excited. Markets have been excited about the prospects for that, but we haven't yet seen it. Let me show you what we've seen so far. It looks like this. Okay, This is just zooming into this year, and I'm trying to break down 
economic indicators across all these 10 major countries and then look at them on a real-time basis, meaning daily or, or weekly. Now, we can't do that with the normal types of economic data we're used to looking at, monthly reports like the jobs report or quarterly reports like GDP or, or earnings, but we can look at things like air pollution, which you know, NO2 emissions are a good proxy for manufacturing activity in certain cities. So we can watch that even on an hourly basis to see what that looks like. We can take a look at commuter traffic to see how that looks every day at rush hour. We can take a look at box office receipts each day and over the weekends to see are people willing to engage in entertainment and groups. Again, all these types of activities we can watch. Are they perfect measure of the economy? No, we have to blend a lot of them together. But over time, they kind of give us a sense of the trend. And that's what you're looking at here. You see the huge plunge as the globe simply shut down in uh, late February, March, and April. All those lockdowns around the world. You remember it well, we all do. Uh, economic activity just slammed to a halt. Uh, these indicators fell from, I'm just indexing them to 100 at the start of the year. They fell really sharply down to 20 uh, in many cases, 20 or 30. But look, the recovery kind of a V-shaped recovery began to unfold there in April, May, June, July, and August. But look what's happened since. It's lost all momentum. It's really been sideways. I call this stage two of the recovery. We're not backtracking. Ig ignore the last week or two. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we are seeing some deterioration. I'll explain that in a sec. But, but, but for much of the last several months, we've kind of been moving sideways. Not getting worse, but not getting better either. Again, stage two of the recovery, stage one being that V-shaped snapback, we're waiting for the vaccine. Vaccine is stage three. It's not a light switch. I mean, there are a lot of caveats associated with this great vaccine news. It's wonderful that messenger RNA works. That means not just Pfizer's uh, uh, vaccine, but there are other therapies that use messenger RNA that may be successful as well. Moderna, a few others that could uh, uh, result in a lot more doses than just what, what, what Pfizer is able to produce next year. But, but the point is, until we get that, until we're able to produce it, literally billions of doses, uh, everybody's got to take it twice, right, around the world, uh, and then and then distribute it. Well, it's you know it's a messenger RNA, so you've got to keep it at negative 112 degrees Fahrenheit. That's colder than my fridge for sure. And then you've got to get people willing to take it. And most surveys show only 20% of people willing to take a new vaccine. So all those caveats mean it's not just flipping a light switch the minute we get a phase three. Uh, uh, um, uh, positive result on a vaccine, but it does mean we're on progress to that. So sometime next year, we enter stage three, I think. That's the V plus shaped global economic and earnings and market recovery we're waiting for. Until then, we've got kind of this choppy market action. Stocks have done better in the last week or so with the news of the vaccine and the clarity around the election, but we've also got some negatives and, and that's what you're seeing in the last couple of weeks of this data. That deterioration, look at that lighter blue line plunging. That's France. So France just went into a lockdown October 30th. Now, it's a little bit of lockdown light versus what they did back in March and April. But France isn't the only one. Ireland's in a lockdown, an even more stringent lockdown. Israel just came out of one. Other countries are imposing, in Europe, imposing different degrees of lockdown. Different states in the US, different locations are re-engaging in different types of activities. I know here in Massachusetts, where I am, you know, we're all, for a while, we didn't have to wear masks outside if you could social distance. Now it's social distancing and masks. We're back to that. So there's a lot of these things that are coming back and it's slowing economic activity. We're seeing that in a real serious way here in France. That has really deteriorated. Um, and it's because of this. It's because of this rising number of new cases. Every single day, we get half a million new cases of COVID. Uh, now, fortunately, we're not seeing that show up in deaths. Daily deaths, which is, I think, more important, still average about 6,000 a day around the world. They averaged that in October. They averaged that in September. August, June, July, April hasn't really changed. So the most at-risk populations seem to be taking proper precautions. Uh, and that's why we're not seeing a return to the degree of lockdown we saw back in March and April in different parts of the world. But nevertheless, we are seeing some return of, of these lockdowns, uh, even though deaths are remaining very low. 
Uh, the lockdowns we're seeing in France, I'll just compare them to what we saw in the spring. Why I, I don't think we're headed for another recession um, is because things are very different. And, and I'd love to get your response on this survey question, by the way. Uh, I'd love to know what you're thinking, but just comparing what we're, what we're seeing in France back in September, uh, back in, in the spring to now, I mean, schools, churches, manufacturing facilities, construction sites remain open. They were not back then. And that's really important, not just to the economy and jobs, but to the stock market. Um, and uh, you know, restaurants and bars are closed, certainly social gatherings restricted, but it's not quite the same thing, even though we're calling it a lockdown. Uh, you know, I, I, interesting results to the survey here about getting a, a, a COVID vaccine in the first half of 2021. I, I'd go along with that. I think there, uh, there's a case to be made. Maybe it's a little earlier, maybe it's a little, little after, a little beyond that. Um, there's always the risk of some mutation that causes that to be moot. And then we've got to find another vaccine to deal with the mutation. But um, hopefully that's the case uh, that, uh, that we do see one in the first half of next year and we unlock that, that V plus shaped recovery. Now, uh, so France and other countries are kind of going through this. I think it's interesting um, what we're seeing, but uh, one of the reasons why it's so important that we're, we're focused on this and kind of measuring it is here. If we take a look at the, um, the service sector lockdowns, they are really having a pretty dramatic effect. I mentioned Ireland went into a six week lockdown. <laughs> this is restaurant reservations, open table, does a pretty good job in a number of different countries around the world, giving us real-time data, daily data on restaurant reservations, sit-down restaurant reservations. And look what happened in Ireland uh, when they went into a lockdown, just a huge plunge. We know there are a lot of jobs tied to the service sector, like restaurants, bars, and theater, and entertainment. And they remain deeply mired in a recession. But there's a portion of the economy that's not, uh, that's, that's, that's really seeing um, continued growth that's still open. And that's the manufacturing sector. As people have shifted their spending from goods to, I'm sorry, from experiences to goods, um, we've really seen a boom in manufacturing and trade. And while that's helped the economy a little bit, it's not enough to offset the slowdown in the service sector. Manufacturing only makes up 17% of the economy. But look at the stock market. It makes up almost half of the stock market of profits and, and where stocks are going. And that's why the stock market seems to be doing quite a bit better than the overall economy or jobs because of that exposure to manufacturing. There's not as much stock market exposure to the restaurants and theaters and bars uh, as there are to you know, businesses that make things. Uh, and and that's, that's one of the reasons why stocks are doing a bit better and the outlook for profits are doing a bit better you can see that here. The blue line on this chart are the number of companies seeing their earnings expectations being raised by analysts. <clears throat> the actual number. And the orange line is the stock market. And I haven't updated this in the last week or two. Um, and it's actually picked up just a little bit. But the point here is that uh, stocks are really connected to earnings. That's the connection between Wall Street and Main Street. It's through the earnings. And earnings are obviously tied to Main Street. If no one's buying anything, there's no earnings. But what you can see here is the prospects for earnings growth really begin to turn around along with, along with the high frequency economic indicators. In May, June, July, August, we saw analysts begin to raise expectations for corporate profits. We're just ending the third quarter earnings season. 85% of companies beat expectations. So analysts have not even been fast enough in raising their forecast to keep up with how fast uh, the recovery has been primarily in manufacturing. Main Street's still hurting. Service jobs uh, <clears throat> and service businesses are still hurting big time, but manufacturing is booming. And that is really helping out the stock market and prospects for earnings, as you can see here in the chart. <clears throat> We've moved you know, somewhat sideways here lately. As we've gone through the earnings season, we've seen more upward revisions. Again, I think it's that vaccine that really unlocks uh, uh, the, next, the next wave of upward revisions to earnings. As we unlock the, the airline sector, as we unlock hotels and just so many businesses that have really seen their earnings get crushed, the energy sector, as more demand for, for transportation begins to pick back up again, we'll start to see another wave of earnings revisions to the upside that'll help bring stocks around next year. One of the reasons also that stocks have been heading higher here in the, in the near term is, oh yeah, this is an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting um, question as well here. The idea of, um, you know, biggest shopping holiday in the world. It's, uh, 
uh, historically, obviously, you know, we know that Black Friday, you know, just thinking back has just always been the world's biggest shopping holiday. It's also been a big online shopping holiday, but then we know Cyber Monday, big event, uh, everybody uh, uh, focusing on that, all the, all the deals. Um, but Alibaba came up with, and, and I'll just, just show you the results. Alibaba came up with this holiday about 11 years ago now called Singles Day. You may not have heard of it. It's on November 11th. That's 1111 on the calendar. That's why it's called Singles Day. It's like the opposite of Valentine's Day where you, um, uh, <laughs> where you, uh, uh, where you buy stuff for yourself. And, you know, in an economy with a one child policy for about 30 years, there's a lot of single dudes and <laughs> they buy a lot of stuff and it's huge, but, but singles day is now spread around the world. It's not just a Chinese phenomenon anymore. In fact, there are many US retailers, Nike, for example, uh, uh, an, a one that sells a lot, Macy's sells a tremendous amount through, on singles day. So it, it's a global holiday now. And it's not only bigger more than twice as big as Black Friday and Cyber Monday combined. It's bigger than all five days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So the whole Thanksgiving weekend, all the way through Monday combined uh, in the last couple of years and accelerating far more rapidly. This year, China's doing much, much better. It's the only economy in the world that's going to grow this year. Income is up. Earnings are up. Uh, jobs are doing really well the Chinese economy is really booming right now. And so I would expect this year, a tremendous singles day tomorrow, uh, as, as we take a look at the health of the Asian consumer, which is a huge driver of not just stocks in Asia. Don't just think about this if you're an emerging market investor, GM, where does GM sell the most cars? China, yeah, yeah, that's where they sell the most cars. Uh, where does Coca-Cola sell the most cases of soda? China. I mean, China matters for all of these classic American businesses. Uh, so no matter where you invest, Singles Day is a huge and important holiday and really, uh, really a big driver. Going to be paying a lot of attention to that tomorrow. Um, so uh, one of the other reasons why earnings are on the rise, not just that China's growth is really kicking in uh, and really turned around since their struggles with the virus earlier this year, is fiscal stimulus. This is a chart of the percent of GDP being applied uh, as fiscal or monetary stimulus, meaning loans from the Fed or, or direct injections of cash by the federal government. This is enormous. Um, you know, back during the great financial crisis, um, we maybe saw four, five, six percent of GDP being injected into the economy. This is 40 to 60 percent of GDP. I mean, it's just massive and it's earlier on. Now, the darker portion of this, the fiscal spending, every one of those dollars, whether it's a check to someone uh, or, or a loan to a business, it shows up somewhere on the income statement of a business, just somewhere it's going to pop up. And that's one of the other reasons why earnings rebounded so quickly. In a lot of ways, this is just money recycled from the government into, into businesses as, as all that aid money got spent. Um, it certainly turned things around fairly quickly. You may note on, on here, China didn't do as much, didn't need to. Uh, its economy bounced back fairly quickly and the, and, and the consumers are doing quite well there. They have the capacity to do a lot more. They haven't. But uh, interesting to note, the best performing stock market in the world this year is China. Yeah, uh, despite doing less stimulus than all the other countries. I know there's often a, some criticism that, oh, the Fed is propping up the stock market. Well, China didn't do it. Uh, China didn't do anywhere near what the Fed did, and yet its stock market performed even better. So I think there's a lot more to it than that. But I think it's an interesting story, but one of the other positive stories behind the earnings momentum trend we've seen this year. Uh, now, let me talk a bit about the election. Got a few charts here on the election. I don't think it's nearly as important as, as COVID or the vaccine. I think the political decision around whether economies get shut down, the degree to those lockdowns, the degree to which they get put in place is, is a more important political decision for the markets here in fourth quarter, believe it or not, than the election was. Usually the markets in the economy influence the election outcome more than the election outcome influence the markets or the economy. But, but we want to talk about it because there are some impacts. And one of them is this, green stocks. So uh, I've been, I'm pointing this chart out. I, I probably first uh, pointed this chart out on my Twitter feed back on October 9th. I think it was, uh, uh, I just look at the last six months at that time. We're now at, at, at seven months of history here. But I just want to focus on this because in early on here, in the first three months of this chart, there was no difference between alternative energy stocks and traditional energy stocks. They were basically performing the same, really tied to the economic picture. 
But once Biden's lead began to solidify in the polls and really then exploded there in late September after the, uh, after the debates, green stocks, solar, wind, energy companies were crushing traditional oil companies by a margin of 80%, 80 percentage point. I mean, just massive move in three months. And so uh, you can see they've been sustained, a little wiggle you know, through the election here, but being sustained, traditional energies come back a little bit on the idea that you know, a vaccine may unlock travel demand. But the point is there's still a very wide gap. I don't think this is sustain, sustainable. Uh, I, I think that the, the blue wave scenario um, of you know, as, as we go through January and, and the August, and the August um, I'm sorry, <laughs> August, I was gonna say Atlanta, but the, the, uh, the Georgia elections that we still have to take place to decide the fate of the Senate are in our opinion, unlikely or, or less likely to result in the Senate being in the hands of the Democrats and it more likely uh, remaining with the, uh, the GOP or at least being evenly divided, making it very hard to pass sweeping climate change legislation and really embrace the Paris Climate Agreement, which will require, um, uh, you know, carbon tariffs um, and uh, uh, climate taxes uh, related to products. You're just not going to get that through a, a very divided Congress. So I think, and, and I think in many ways that was getting priced in to the gap between these. So I think this gap continues to close. And, and something that may, you know, maybe the market got a little overexcited about those green stocks and the prospects for a, a blue wave coming out of the election. So I'd look for this gap to narrow. Uh, one of the other outcomes, and I think that this is probably the most obvious stock market takeaway from the election, this very wide gap um, that I, I think is less supported now. Uh, one of the other takeaways is we are in a transition period to a new presidential administration. And as the Biden administration selects uh, hundreds, thousands of appointees to critical posts, this is usually a time where foreign adversaries choose to move in opposition to U.S. interests. They often find the U.S. is distracted during this period of time or think it's unable to respond. And we've frequently seen actions by Iran, by Russia, uh, by North Korea, even China. Uh, you know, in the transition of the Trump administration, China went and intercepted uh, a U.S. drone uh, in the South China Sea that China felt was in its territory. They would not have done that uh, if we weren't in the transition to a new administration. So I'm watching on high alert for some type of development, a new missile test from North Korea or a new nuke test in North Korea, uh, some action by Russia as it relates to uh, solidifying its gains in, in Syria and just crushing the remaining amount of opposition there. Uh, looking at Iran, whose back is against the wall with these sanctions and not sure what's going to happen. Iran's got an election coming up in June. Likely hardliners are going to win that. It was a reform uh, reform leadership that actually worked on that deal with the U.S. that, that Trump backed out of uh, on sanctions and, and, and uh, containing Iran's nuclear ambitions. That may be off the table entirely, so you could look for Iran to do something. My point is, long story short, is that markets get jittery during this period of time when we see these events. But the takeaway is that when the market's in recovery from a recession or growing, it tends not to last very long. That's the point of this chart. Take a look at this chart. There are two blue lines that from election day to inauguration day uh, were negative. That was in 2000 and 2008. Had nothing to do with the presidents, had everything to do with the fact that we were in recessions. Okay, so we were in a recession. We had geopolitical developments take place, um, a number of them in fact, uh, but, uh, but, but the, the financial crisis and the tech wreck back in 2000 were far more important to the tra trajectory of the stock market. So look at all the others. Uh, we're just starting up with the Biden administration. Take a look at the other four. They were all positive, slightly positive. And that's despite a number of geopolitical events taking place. I think we're probably most similar to the um, 1980 to, to early 81 environment when Reagan was coming in because we were just, and a recession just ended in January of 1980 or in, in the first half of 1980. So we're just kind of coming out of recession, kind of similar to where we are now. Stock market therefore is vulnerable to shocks uh, as it was then, you know, the, the, the Iran hostage crisis peaked in January of 1981. So all that was going on. Uh, the other time I think is similar is the transition of the Clinton administration in 92. Uh, we had just come out of the 91 recession. The economy was still weak, jobs had yet to recover. So the economy was weak, vulnerable to a shock. 
and we had uh, a number of different events uh, take place uh, over that period of time. We had uh, Iraq move uh, anti-aircraft missiles into the no-fly zone, uh, and U.S. and Allied bombers had to, had to bomb those sites, and there was you know stress around all of that. So these events naturally occurred during this multi-week stretch of time. But look. Even in those periods, just coming out of a recession, the economy vulnerable, major global developments, the stock market still was flat to up over that period of time because we're in a recovery and that didn't shake the recovery. So my point to you is we're off to a good start here with the Biden administration uh, and you know, this transition from election day to inauguration day, but expect some shakeups, expect some volatility along the way, but still probably on track towards gains as we look out to a better 2021 for earnings, the economy, all that on the back of you know, continued improvement towards that stage three and, and a vaccine. One more election chart, and then I want to get to the investment takeaways, and that's this one. Elections often mark turning points where in years of outflows from the stock market, which we have been seeing, people taking money out of stocks and putting it in bonds, begins to turn around and come back into stocks. Um, just, just unique. This is just a fact. This is why it happens. We can all explain maybe why, maybe it's greater clarity, maybe, I, I don't know. People are waiting whatever reason this seems to be, and it seems to drive performance. So the blue line there are changes in performance of the stock market. The orange line is change in the dollars of money coming into US, uh, US and international equity. So all international mutual funds and ETFs taking a look at those flows in billions of dollars. And you can see, boom, 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 boom. It lines up again and again and again with presidential elections. I don't know, you know, it just does. And so maybe after a record-breaking amount of selling uh, and people moving money into bonds in recent years, despite low yields, maybe that begins to turn around. And maybe that's another wind to our back here as we move through this transition period and into next year and the recovery that we get these inflows into the market. I probably don't have to remind you that the biggest buyers of stocks over the last couple of years that have pushed stocks higher were the companies themselves doing share buybacks, right? It wasn't individual investors. Right? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't people saving for their retirement, saving for their futures. It was companies just using their cash to buy shares back. That may shift now. We may actually get maybe a better and more fundamental basis of support for a market advance in the form of money coming back into the stock market. That tends to happen post-election, no matter who wins. So that's my other, other chart. Um, happy to talk about specific outcomes from the election, but I think with a very, very divided Congress, don't expect sweeping changes. Um, you know, legislate gridlock is good. Market tends to like that uh, because there's greater clarity for the earnings environment going forward if we don't have sweeping legislative reform. So the idea that uh, Washington may take less of a role uh, in driving the market going forward and, and, and Biden's foreign policy is more multilateral than unilateral, meaning it's slower moving, more transparent, uh, and therefore less shocking to the markets uh, uh, than say policy by tweet. So, uh, so I think that's probably uh, uh, favorable also to, to a further recovery in the equity markets tied to the election. So again, we can talk more about that if you want to. Let me move to the investment takeaways uh, before I get to your questions, because I'm, I'm here about 30 minutes in. So this is a chart that I've included in every presentation I've given for more than 20 years. I wish it was prettier. I wish it was more obvious what I'm referring to. Uh, I've never figured out a way to make it look better, but bear with me because I think it's really important. This chart got a lot of attention last year. It may be familiar to you. It's the yield curve. What I mean is it's the difference between long-term and short-term interest rates. That's that dark blue line across the bottom. <clears throat> Usually, it's positive, meaning if you take long-term rates and you subtract short-term interest rates, it's usually positive because long-term rates are higher than short-term rates, right? Usually a 30-year mortgage rate is higher than a, a three-month CD, and so the difference is positive. But not always. Sometimes long-term rates drop below short-term rates. It's very rare. We call that an inversion of the yield curve. Happened last year, got a lot of attention. Every time that's happened and that blue line dropped below zero, I marked it with an orange dot. So you see there are seven orange dots and seven gray columns. <laughs> yeah, every one of those gray, every one of those orange dots comes almost exactly a year before those gray columns, which we remember are recessions, right? When this happens, it doesn't cause the recession, but it's a signal that there's a, an imbalance in the economy. 
that things are heating up in the short term, but cooling down longer term, not as much demand by businesses for borrowing to, to invest in their businesses, but, but, but the unemployment, you know, things, things are heating up in the short term, suggesting that you know, it's probably going to end in the form of, of some recession. It doesn't tell you how deep or how bad the recession or how long it's going to be. It just tells you one might be coming. So again, this was another chart that showed up in my outlook for 2020, published a year ago, that this signal was once again giving us a warning sign. But I was less focused on the idea that we might get a recession in bear market this year and more focused on what I'm about to tell you about, that a rotation might start, because this is what people miss. Uh, it's one thing to, to, you know, stocks fall for, for a few months and then they begin to rebound. That's one thing. Very difficult to time. What's, what's more important, I think, is the longer term shift between the laggards and the leaders in the market cycle. Whenever we, get, whenever we go through one of these yield curve inversions and, and a recession, we get new leadership in the market. Whatever was leading us in the last cycle, the best performing stocks, the best performing asset classes, suddenly turn out not so good going forward. And those laggards start to be the leaders. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a chart illustrating as best I can. This is the difference between US and international stocks. And that's what I'm mainly gonna focus on here. Although we could show growth in value stocks, large and small cap stocks, all the same. <clears throat> I've gone back to the early eighties here because I wanted to show you a period uh, where international stocks really outperformed. And that's what the blue line is telling us. When the blue line's going up, just one divided by the other. It's when international stocks are outperforming the U.S. stock market. And when the orange line's going up, that's when U.S. stocks are outperforming international stocks. And back in the 80s, it was all about Japan. International stocks were crushing U.S. stocks. Japan had the biggest stock market in the world and the best companies in the world, and they were taking off. But then we got to that blue column. That first blue column. Now that blue column isn't gray. It's not a recession. That blue column is that orange dot on the prior slide. That, that period where that, the blue line was below zero, the yield curve inversion, signaling a recession was about to happen and things that and changes were afoot. And sure enough, they were. We very quickly saw reversal and US stocks began to outperform and international stocks began to lag. And then we got to the next yield curve inversion and, and then switched again. And then it switched again in 2007. After that yield curve inversion in the 08 recession, we saw US stocks led by that orange line outperform international stocks by the same margin. We saw international stocks outperform US stocks back in the 80s. And now we hit another yield curve inversion and another recession. And I think again, this relationship is switching. International stocks outperformed in the 80s till we got the recession in, in 1990. Then uh, uh, U.S. stocks outperformed till we got the recession in 2000. Then international stocks began to outperform till we got the recession in 08. Then U.S. stocks began to outperform till we got to the recession in 2020. And now, once again, I think we're flipping the switch back to international stock outperformance. No one is watching this. No one's thinking about this. They're focused on the vaccine. They're focused on the FANG stocks. They're focused on their healthcare favorites. They're focused on Peloton. I don't know. But they are not looking at this trend. And I think it's a really important one. Uh, and this is the evidence that it works again and again. I could show you 50 years on this. It flip-flops every cycle. We're just starting a new cycle. This could last 10 years. Let me show you why it works. Here's, here's it works. Let me show you why I think it works. It has to do with valuations uh, as much as anything else and, and, and interest rates as well. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the things I think it's really interesting here is, you know, when might the Fed hike interest rates? It's all related to the yield curve, right? And, the, the Fed tends to control short-term interest rates as opposed to long-term interest rates. And it, yeah, it'll likely be a long time. You note here uh, that uh, you know, 2023, 2024, yeah, that's, that's very likely uh, probably the earliest we'd, we'd, like to see, we'd expect to see the Fed begin to raise interest rates. I'd frankly like to see them do it a little earlier, but that's probably when they'll be, be looking to do it. So rates will remain low for a while. That'll probably remain a headwind for the dollar for some time. But let me uh, let me jump to, uh, to to this here. The the interesting notion of um, why this works it has to do with valuations. Uh, this is a chart of eighty five years of the price to earnings ratio for the S and P five hundred. So valuations for U S stocks, price divided by the earnings. But I flipped it upside down. That's the orange line, but it's upside down. So when stocks are expensive, the line's at the bottom part of the chart. And when they're cheap, it's at the top part of the chart. And the reason I flipped it upside down, you can see the scale on the left, is because of the blue line. The blue line 
is the return on the stock market over the next 10 years, the 10 year annualized return. I just took it and shifted it back 10 years. That's all I did. Just took, and, and when I do that, look how well it lines up with the valuation when you flip it upside down, meaning the higher the price you pay, the lower your return is likely to be. And the lower the price you pay, the higher return you're likely to, to be, likely to be over the next 10 years. It works amazingly well for 85 years through periods of war, through high inflation, low inflation, through periods of, of protectionism, through periods of free trade, um, through, through periods of global pandemics. This has worked again and again and again. Now, if you look at where the blue line ends, remember, I just shifted it over 10 years on the chart. You can see the scale on the bottom different. That's where we've just ended. We've ended uh, a really good 10 years of return for the S&P 500, even with the pullback and rally this year. Stocks have been double digit. Stock returns on an annualized basis have been double digit right where the price to earnings ratio 10 years ago told us it was going to be just where it lined up. But look where it is now. Not so exciting. Low single digits. Now that's probably better than bonds and cash, but it's not anything to get real excited about. I mean, it might be a little higher than this. It's not a perfect relationship, but not too exciting. So this is one of the reasons why this works. After a whole cycle of outperformance and in rising valuations, stocks have less gas. They've just got less to give over the next 10 years. But here's the exciting part. If we look out, whoops, if we look out over the next 10 years uh, for international stocks, the picture is much brighter. Take a look at where this is ending up, uh, where, where the price to earnings ratio is, is, you know, somewhere suggesting a return of around 10%. That's, that's really good. That's great. That's a far cry from where it was 10 years ago when returns were, well, forecasted to be pretty lackluster for international stocks. And they were, right? U.S. stocks outperformed by five or six percentage points a year for the last 10 years. Well, that may now be reversing. Uh, and that's uh, <laughs> an interesting survey at the moment. It's fascinating to, to think about what's going on globally right now. Um, you know, as, as we head into this, this shopping season, I've been watching this lately. Uh, it's actually up. So compared to, uh, uh, yeah, compared to a, um, a year ago, the, the price to ship from Shanghai to Los Angeles, um, one of those 40 foot, you know, units you see on container ships and on, on trucks and on trains, uh, is, has more than, more than doubled. It's up 300% from a year ago. Booming manufacturing activity. You have to remember a year ago, uh, global trade had really slowed down quite a bit. And so this is a really sharp turnaround. People aren't, aren't leaving home uh, and they're spending a lot more on stuff and that stuff is getting shipped over. So a tremendous amount of, of just booming trade activity uh, and exports from China. Um, uh, China's selling more to the U.S. than they ever have, uh, thanks, to, thanks to the pandemic. Um, so fascinating outcome of all of that. But setting that aside for a second, uh, just getting back to this valuation story, this is why it works, because valuations are, in fact, uh, just completely flipped uh, between the U.S. And, and international markets uh, and suggesting much better returns. So let me quickly just, just, just point out to you it's actually happening this year. So here's a chart of international stocks and U.S. stocks. The index is called the MSCI ACWI, All Country World Index is what that stands for. Literally every stock in the world, excluding the US. And what I'm looking at here is the equal weighted return, just looking at the average international stock versus the average US stock this year. And I haven't updated this in a week or so. Obviously stocks have, have rallied post the election and, and given the, uh, the, the vaccine announcement. But even ahead of that, uh, international stocks were outperforming US stocks slightly, only by 2%. Um, but that's the first time that's happened in years. So remember, remember I pointed out that we're seeing a shift in the cycle. That usually means a shift between U.S. international outperformance and, and, and valuations and everything's lining up to, uh, to, to explain why that should again happen this time. And look, it actually is. It's actually beginning to unfold. The average international stock is beginning to outperform. I think that's going to be a story, not just here for the remainder of the fourth quarter, not just for next year, but for this entire cycle, which hopefully lasts another 10 years, that we see better international performance. The takeaway from this is that rebalancing is really important. Broad diversification in portfolios, as difficult it is as it is right now to, to look at the parts of your portfolio that have not performed well in recent years, uh, like international or like value stocks, and 
and remember why you're there and, and, and rebalance that and sell the leaders and buy the laggards. It's, it's how you stay on path to your financial goals, but it's emotionally difficult. Um, now is the most important time to do that in any time in the last 10 years. It's always important to do it. It's more important than ever right now to be on track. So let me wrap up and say, watch those COVID numbers, particularly the death numbers. As long as they remain low, we can wait this out till we get to stage three without seeing these lockdowns, this policy response dip us into another recession. That said, I'm watching the data very closely. Expect some volatility. That means up days and down days as we work through this transition period to a new administration, but also also, as we work towards that, that vaccine and unlock that stage three of the recovery. Finally, new cycle means new leadership in the market. So broadening beyond those, uh, you know, those few stocks that have really led the way for years now to a much broader market participation in this new cycle. I think it's a good thing, something I'm looking forward to. So let me stop there, Brad, and, and we'll see what questions have come in, what questions you may have, and uh, look forward to hearing from all of you. All right, sounds good. Thanks you for uh, sharing that information with us. We've got a number of questions that have come in um, and continue to come in. So um, I'm going to try to take multiple questions and wrap them in, maybe into one uh, and catch general themes. So you mentioned the rotation that maybe you're seeing US to international. You, you alluded to value, growth to value, large to small. Are you seeing signs of those uh, rotations in those areas as well? Yeah, very much so. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the ones that really stands out is a rotation from a sector called uh, communication services, which has got most of the FANG stocks in it, right? It's, it's really about internet services and shopping and working from home. That has really started to rotate under. And financials, a classic value sector, really has started to outperform here lately on a steeper yield curve and better prospects for uh, loan losses and all those types of things. Maybe the return of dividends for many of those companies next year, all very bright outlooks. So that rotation is driving uh, the, the rotation into value and away from growth, but also international. Financials is the biggest sector of non-US companies, whereas tech is, of course, the biggest sector here in the US. Okay. Um, how about... Um... Oil prices, so that's gotten related to energy and, and certainly the aspects of energy. We're talking about green energy and so on before. Any expectations on oil prices going forward and thoughts along those lines? Um, you know, it's a hard commodity to predict the price of. Let me just say, I think the trend is, is modestly higher as demand recovers. I think there's a lot of pent up travel demand. You know, we can see it in, in reservations uh, for airlines, which have really started to pick up. Flights are really booked. Uh, airlines are bringing more planes back out of mothballs and, and filling them up. Uh, <clears throat> we're also starting to see, you know, um, uh, uh, you know people... Um, travel a lot more in their cars and, 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 you know, consider this holiday season, you know, Thanksgiving going and traveling around here in the U.S. We saw it in China for a week called Golden Week, which was in, in early October. Uh, half a billion people took and traveled and, and that really picked up. And so, so that, that, <clears throat> that's happening. The, the demand side's picking up. But Brad, let me also say on the supply side, I think the market's maybe a little too optimistic. I don't think we're going to see as much supply as the market believes of oil. One of the reasons for that I hinted at, which is that June election in Iran, very likely to see a hardline conservative government come into place, which is not as likely to go along with uh, renewed offers from the Biden administration to go back to that, you know, um, uh, contain the nuclear ambitions in exchange for allowing them to export oil again. Uh, Iran is, is, you know, shipping their oil offshore and then transferring of one tanker to another, turning off the, the signal locators, and then they're finding ways to export oil, I would say illegally, but they're finding ways to do it. Uh, and they're not going to warm up to some of the uh, uh, demands of, of what the Biden administration and other allies would, would put on them. My point is, we may not see new supply from, from Iran come out in the way, and that's 2 million barrels per day, in the way that many are expecting is immediately going to hit the market in a very public way uh, come, come, uh, uh, come early next year. Don't think that's going to happen. So the, the supply demand mix, I think, remains favorable for energy, could be one of the sectors that, that does well next year. Okay. Um, how about, let's go back to the international markets. Uh, do you have, um, when, you, when you're looking at this rotation, are you looking at developed markets, emerging markets? How, how are you, how are you uh, looking at that? That's a, that's a really great question. Mainly I was referring to developed markets. We have a long history of, of developed market data that I can draw conclusions from. The emerging market indexes only go back to 1987. 
So we've got three or four economic cycles there. I can draw some conclusions, but but back in the 80s and early 90s, that index was mainly driven by commodity producers. Brazil was like the biggest weight back then. And then in the 90s, it was really driven more by financials in Asia. And now the biggest sector is tech and China makes up more than 40% of the index. So it's changed so much over time. It's hard to draw cycle conclusions. But what I can say is it's a very economically sensitive group of companies and manufacturing oriented. So as manufacturing and uh, and the Asian economy has roared back, and I, you know Korea is doing an amazing job here. Only uh, you know 93 new cases uh, uh, on a five-day average. Looking back, just done a wonderful job containing COVID. Um, their economies are doing really well. So I like that story, particularly here over the next year. Emerging markets, the booming Chinese and Asian economy, the fact that they've contained COVID. They don't have to wait uh, to get all these vaccines produced. They're doing just fine. Uh, so that coupled with this economic economic rebound and manufacturing boom uh, is pretty good news for them. How, um, how about um, if there's a, you talked about stimulus and the governments uh, injecting stimulus into their economies uh, across the, uh, the globe. If the US, um, we have another stimulus package um, and an infrastructure uh, bill that's passed, will that impact this potential rotation that you're seeing? That's a good question. Uh, you know, fingers crossed that we do see them. I think that I think they may be uh, smaller than than we'd like. And and uh, every every new uh, election cycle, I think, hey, now's the time to do infrastructure. We've got divided government. They can agree on this. I said that four years ago. I said that four years before that. <laughs> Hopefully, we can get something done. Um, but yeah, that's you know that's that's an injection that goes you know right uh, right into the economy. It's money that's very quickly spent, and yeah, it should help a rotation into value oriented sectors, particularly raw materials. You know, most construction businesses, you know, at the state and local level that do a lot of that that road uh, uh, construction bridges. Um, uh, are not publicly traded, but of course the commodities that they use are, uh, and and the fact they may need more uh, caterpillar, uh, you know, uh, pieces of earth moving equipment or deer or, or uh, whatever, uh, Komatsu or Hitachi, uh, all those companies may benefit from that. So it would certainly be a stimulus package for the industrial part of the economy. Okay, all right. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, let's talk a little bit about um, kind of related to stimulus. So interest rates inflation? Uh, is there a chance that the economy could be overheated with too much stimulus? Mm. And uh, should investors and our clients be thinking in terms of protecting against uh, an inflationary environment? Um, while it's not our base case scenario, I think the odds are higher than the market is pricing in of, of that kind of an outcome. Um, demand is coming back and we are seeing signs of, you know, inflation reviving in a number of places. This stimulus is very different than back in 08 and 09, when all the stimulus was really directed into pouring capital into banks to make sure, making sure they wouldn't collapse. Well, that money never got out of the bank. So it never really got into the real economy. This time, the money's literally being written checks and, and given to people and businesses. That's getting right into the economy. Uh, and, and without a, a supply response, you, you do potentially end up with, uh, with some inflation. Our view is inflation heads back to 2% or so, not that it goes to 3 or 4 or 5 which would be really negative, obviously, for, for yield. Bond yields would shoot up and the recovery would be miserable if we saw the 10-year. As much as we'd all like to earn much more on our, on our bonds in terms of interest, a 5% 10-year yield, um, you know, implying corporate yields of, of 7% or even 8 you know, companies aren't funding projects now. They certainly wouldn't at those levels. So, uh, so I, yeah, I, I think that um, I think there's there's a greater risk than the market is pricing in with yields still below just one percent on the ten year. Uh, uh, so I'd say if there's risk, there's risk to the upside in terms of yields, but not dramatic upside that we need to worry about a shock of much higher interest rates and and a double dip recession associated with that. Okay. All right. How about, um, again, kind of somewhat tied to the stimulus uh, question, but the national debt that's growing mm -hmm. uh, here in the U.S.? I mean, I, I know that's probably in the short term not going to have impact, but, but as you look out in the long term, do, what, what do you see the impact of the growing debt? I know I was on a Schwab conference yesterday, um, kind of post-election wrap-up, and there was a comment made that I think over the last I think it was 10, 10 years or so, the debt has tripled, but the servicing of that debt has stayed relatively the same because rates have come down so much. So 
I mean, what do you see there as you just think in terms of, of the debt and, and that perspective? Yeah, it's probably the thing I, I lose the most sleep over is, is all that debt in the global financial system. Uh, it is, it's three times higher than it was 10 years ago. And it's, it's uh, six times higher than it was back in 2001. Um, <clears throat> but the difference is interest rates, right? So we're just not paying any more. So therefore it doesn't have any immediate impact. Uh, as long as the service cost is the same, you know, as much debt as you want, your interest costs are the same. Heck in Europe with negative interest rates, pfft, you know, uh, not a problem. The problem, of course, is when the rates begin to rise. Um, and there, there are a number of pressure valves that, that go along with that. In my, from my perspective, the dollar is, is the one that gives first. And we're already starting to see that this year. Uh, our view is the dollar continues to depreciate in the years ahead. Not dramatically, but maybe a, a one, two, three, four percent a year. Um, and because we're borrowing so much, we're pushing so many dollars in the world's financial system, uh, which, which is already fully funded with them, uh, that, that that's a weight. Plus the Fed simply not being able to hike interest rates for quite some time. We just saw it in our survey, 2023, 2024, maybe even beyond. Um, and where you get that yield on your cash really helps uh, to, to, to drive you know, what, what currency performs the best. So Brad, I, I think probably in, in, in the coming years, let's say in the next one to five years, the dollar is the pressure point on that buildup of debt and perhaps higher interest rates. As we look out 10 to 20 years, I don't know what the answer is. I look to Japan. You know, Japan has nearly three times as much debt relative to the size of its economy that we do. And it still hasn't hit a wall still continuing to issue debt, still continuing to, to, uh, to, to fund an expansionary deficit. Um, now, you know, eventually they will. And so I'm going to watch uh, and, and see what happens. Is it the, the yen deteriorates? Is it the, you know, what happens? What's the end game there? But if it hasn't happened in Japan, which is 20 years demographically and, and debt wise ahead of us, then we're probably not on the near term horizon. So I say I lose sleep about it. It's more, you know, the longer term outlook in the near term, we just expect that to show up in a slightly weaker dollar and the dollars depreciated on average 1% a year since the early seventies when we left the gold standard. So that's not a devastating scenario at all for our standard of living or, or anything like that. So I think we can manage it in the near term. Okay. All right. Um, how about this one? This is changing directions a little bit, but what will the new administration policy toward China look like? Hmm. Good question. Um, you know, because I, I think a lot of things coming out of this election is gridlocked and, and won't matter, tax rates and all of that. But this is one that will. Uh, there definitely will be some shakeup here with, with regard to US-China relations. Now, I'm not going to say they're, they're going to be good. Um, there's still a lot of frictions between the US and China, clearly as it relates to strategic leadership on technology issues, 5G, robotics, AI, definite strategic um, uh, conflict of interest there. There's uh, territorial uh, disputes in the South China Sea that are going to go on. Um, there's a lot of things uh, that, but Biden's approach to dealing with China in the past uh, as VP was multilateral. Right, it was trying to get uh, our peers to come together and agree on certain provisions and get China to go along with it. That's what the Trans-Pacific Partnership was all about. That that uh, um, uh, Trump backed out of back in in 2016. That was an attempt to try and get China on the board with what were the priorities of the Obama Biden administration at the time, which were and for Biden still are environmental and labor oriented. Okay, these are the two number one priorities for Biden as it relates to China: environment and labor standards, not manufacturing jobs and trade balance, which was the sole focus of the Trump administration. So there's still friction there, but it's different. And China has been embracing a lot of green technologies and green goals. You know, they're probably going to get to um, an all electric vehicle fleet in their country way before anybody else does because they simply are mandating it. Uh, and they're going to, you know, they can, they can turn over manufacturing industries fairly quickly when you have one party in power and you have the ability to set these rules. It's amazing what you can get done. So, uh, so on the green, on the environmental front, I think they might actually lead the U.S. Um, uh, when it comes to labor standards, that's another issue. So I, I still think there's points of friction, but again, they're multilateral and they're slower moving. And, and I think there's maybe less to upset the market. That said, um, you know, uh, a lot of our technology companies may continue to have challenges operating in China, but a lot of our consumer goods companies, the Nikes, the GMs of the world, probably going to breathe a sigh of relief. Okay. Um, 
switching gears again. So I've got a number of questions uh, questions that re are related to construction forecast in 2021. So any thoughts there? Uh, just, I mean, it seems to be kind of red hot right now. There's a lot of, as I travel around to, um, I've been traveling as much lately, but but certainly as we get to uh, some of our office locations and markets that we're in, it seems like there's quite a bit of construction activity still taking place uh, and expansion. Well, what are your thoughts in 2021 from that standpoint? Yeah, I, and, and Brad, of course, those deals were financed two years ago and <laughs> approved three years ago. And so, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. This is one of the biggest mysteries. And, I, and I've talked to a lot of experts in the REIT space, a lot of, you know, all American II ranked analysts on this front. I, I, I'm talking to a lot of business people in this area, major cities, um, and looking at our own footprint in, in, in Schwab and, and, you know, how, how we operations are. I, I just don't know from a business office space that we're going to absorb that much very quickly this time. Now, look, people said that after 9 11, they said that after the global financial crisis, they said, so I don't want to, you know, repeat those mistakes. People said that about, oh, we're never going to travel again after 9-11 and, and six months later, you know, planes were full. So I don't want to say we're never going to go back to the office. Clearly we will, but maybe not to the same degree, maybe not to the same utilization of space. And so, you know, I think, uh, and, and look at, you know, retailers. So I think if you're looking at, uh, and I'm, First, I'm thinking about this from a, from a, from a REIT perspective, mall-based REITs, which have been hurting for a while, that's probably not getting any better. Office could be in some, some trouble, but I think you know apartments, fine. Uh, storage, fine. Factory, fine. But actually, in fact, really good. So I think where you might see some, some growth is more maybe on the factory side. I think a lot of businesses, to the extent that they can, are creating redundant supply chains. Right. So um, uh, the miniaturization of manufacturing and, and its mobility has allowed us to not have one supply chain located in the cheapest location from a labor perspective, but actually have multiple, multiple supply chains around the world now. So you're seeing more spending on that factory space, even in the U.S., um, you know, Cummins engine, which which still makes like 90 percent of its engines overseas. Well, maybe now. Well, it's probably it's actually Mexico where they're building at the moment. But but you know they might move some of that some of that back to the U.S. to supply the U.S. market. It's possible. Uh, so you're seeing some of that in in the factory space. Uh, but I just don't know on the office front. And anyone's guess is 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 good or maybe better than mine uh, on that side. But th what we're seeing now with the construction activity that was stuff that was put in place you know pre-COVID um, and financed well ahead of that. So we'll see what happens going forward. Um, you know. One of the positives is that the cost to carry that space has come down a lot too, right? So one of the challenges for a lot of these real estate operating companies is, is when uh, banks just stop lending and, 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 and tenants go away and they're really stuck. Well, banks are flush with capital. They're happy to lend. They're happy to extend those debt terms uh, in order to you know, have borrowers. So, so the rates have come down and the capital is available. So they're unlikely to just you know, go under right away. But the question is, when will that demand begin to turn around? And I just, I just don't have a great crystal ball on that front. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, let's see. I think we've um, probably getting toward the end here. Um, just looking through. This is great. Really smart questions. Yeah. Uh, any other sectors that um, here in the U.S. that you would say? you know, have potential for 2021 versus other sectors that, that might, that might lag a little bit? Yeah. So, I, so I mentioned financials, I guess I mentioned energy as well. I think industrials and this continued manufacturing boom, I think the markets are thinking, well, let's look at the service sector. Uh, let's look at airlines. Let's look at, you know, energy. And yeah, I get that. There'll be a rotation into that, but I, I don't want to neglect the fact that we, after two years of, of, in two and a half years now of a real slowdown in manufacturing tied to the trade environment, that could really have some long legs. Inventories are still very low of manufactured goods, uh, <clears throat> cars, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, just amazing to see how this has turned around fairly quickly. So I really think the manufacturing sector is, is still in for a very strong 2021 and earnings estimates are still too low. Uh, and as those go up, I think the stocks are going to track higher as well. So other classic value sector that could do well next year. The other thing I'll say is healthcare. Um, healthcare is usually a defensive sector. It's not one you want to jump into when the economy is rebounding. But there was so much worry about a blue wave outcome of this election and what it would mean to pricing for pharmaceuticals 
or, uh, or what have you in, in terms of managed care and, and, and the ACA and all these types of things that, uh, that is really coming back. Valuations are very low. And, uh, and so this isn't so much about the vaccine, it's really more around retaining um, uh, healthcare coverage and getting back to electio- elective procedures, which have been deferred and deferred and deferred. There's gonna be a boom in those. Uh, and also just this idea that uh, the, the political risk isn't entirely out of that space, but is drained to some degree. And, and that could provide some momentum there on valuations moving higher. All right, excellent. All right. Well, we're a little bit past our time, so um, I think we'll we'll wrap up. But again, um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a privilege having you here, and um, I'm already getting messages from people within Ide Bailey that are giving you a thumbs up and appreciating your comments Wonderful. today. So, uh, with that, we'll wrap that wrap things up today, and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, on our next webinar sometime in the near future. Fantastic! I look forward to that invitation. Thanks, Brad. Thanks everyone right. for joining in. All right, bye-bye.